everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so welcome to the University of Michigan School of Nursing Office of Health Equity and Inclusions Health Equity Speaker Series. Um, today's event will feature a conversation with University of Michigan's Michigan School of Nursing alum, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ed Yakel. Um, the conversation will be moderated by Brock Willett, one of the outstanding co-leaders of our new Men in Nursing University of Michigan student organization. Uh, the event today is programmed in recognition of Men's Health Awareness Month and Veterans Week. The sponsors of the event are the Men in Nursing um, University of Michigan Student Organization and the Ann Arbor Chapter of American Association of Men in Nursing. The next event in the Health Equity Speaker Series will be held on Thursday, November 18th at 12 p.m. The University of Michigan School of Nursing uh, student uh, nursing students of color invite all to virtually meet uh, nursing scholar Dr. Margaret Moss for a conversation on American Indian visibility, data, distortion, and diversity in the healthcare context. University of Michigan School um, Nursing faculty Dr. Philip Belize will moderate. Um, so our moderator today, Brock Willett, is a third year graduate student in the Doctor of Nursing Practice program, specializing in family practice with concentrations in occupational health and safety and global health, and the certificate in trauma-informed care. As a registered nurse, Brock works in employee and occupational health in a mechanical engineering plant. And in his leadership positions, Brock uh, serves as a vice president of the student chapter of the Michigan Council of Nurse Practitioners, he is the student director at large of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. And finally, Dr. Brock is a proud member of the American uh, Association of Men in Nursing, which is a professional organization for nurses that works to improve gender inclusion in the nursing profession. Um, and uh, just to uh, let everybody know that we are encouraging um, everybody to join our group, Men in Nursing. And um, it, no matter what your um, identity is, we, you are more than welcome to join. And if you could please you know, put your name in the chat function, we will put you on our listserv and keep you updated with uh, future events. So with that said, take it away, Brock. Well, thank you so much for the intro. I appreciate it. I'll be introducing uh, Dr. Yakel here, and then we will move on to the uh, actual reason why we're here. So Edward E. Yakel is the acting executive uh -huh. director of the VHA National Center for Patient Safety. Dr. Yakel joined the National Center for Patient Safety in December, 2019, after retiring from an extensive military career, reaching the rank of Colonel. He was instrumental in leading the Army Medical Command into a quality improvement journey, establishing it as a learning organization. He is currently serving as the Acting Executive Director of the NCPS. I'd like you all now to put your hands together for Dr. Yeager. Recording in progress. Thanks so much. Can you folks see and hear me? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Great to be with you today, Brock. I look forward to facilitating, having you facilitate any questions that the group may have. Um, there's a variety of ways we can take this conversation. I hope we can make it uh, a sort of a, a round conversation and f uh, have a lot of feedback from the group. So please feel free if that's an acceptable methodology for us to proceed um, in our conversation today. One of the things I was asked to speak about was uh, my experiences as a military nurse. Um, by the way, I'm Ed and identify my identifiers are he, him. Um, and so I welcome everybody in this cultural diversity inclusion lecture. Um, a little bit of feedback. Uh, I did graduate from University of Michigan uh, from their master's as a family nurse practitioner. I won't tell you which year it was because I'm only 28. So, you know, I'm fairly young here, but 
Uh, I started off actually in my military career, uh, graduating with a baccalaureate degree. When you enter the military uh, and don't have a degree, you enter in the enlisted rank. Um, and by entering after obtaining my bachelor's degree, then you uh, end up um, entering at, a, at an officer rank. Um, and so that's why I did that. I also did it because I was in, I come from the upper peninsula of Michigan, a small town called Iron River. I did my baccalaureate degree at Lake State University. And then um, through the military, I was able to obtain two master's degrees and my doctorate in nursing practice. And I can describe that journey as we have more discussions. One of the interesting things to think about in the military is they've been very progressive, although people may not think that. Um, the military was first integrated males in nursing in about 1971 with the advent of Vietnam War. Historically, of course, we know that monks serving in monasteries acted as nurses in the past. Um, and then really when nursing became more codified is with the advent of Florence Nightingale, who's also been heralded for infection prevention and statistician, being a statistician. Um, about one third of uh, males who are in the army the Army Nurse Corps is a very diverse population. I'll speak to the Army Nurse Corps because that's what I have experience with. Um, about one third of the uh, people who are in the Army Nurse Corps out of 3,000 nurses, about three to 4,000 active duty nurses, I should clarify, because um, we also have Reserve and National Guard. About one third of that nurse population are males. And as I said, in 1971, at the advent of the Vietnam War, the males were recognized Interestingly, African-American nurses were recognized by Eleanor Roosevelt. She asked that uh, our African-American colleagues be recognized with, uh, in the nurse corps with an official officer rank, and she advocated for that. And we know that we had African-American nurses ser serving during the wo Civil War, Spanish-American War, and other wars, but they weren't officially recognized until uh, uh, the uh, president's wife asked that to happen and then it did happen over time. So there's a long history of innovation and pro progress within the military um, that's really interesting to think about. So that's sort of the background. Um, how, how would you like me to progress in my discussion today? I'm making it very open. I don't have any slides. So where do we wanna go next? What, what, is, what are folks interested in hearing about? And this is open to anyone. You guys can either place in the chat and I'd be happy to read it off or you can just uh, unmute yourself hopefully one by one and we'll try and monitor it. Okay, well, let me, let me just talk a little bit more. Uh, intersection, okay. So thanks, Megan. I see your question and then Christopher, uh, okay. Um, so let me first talk about um, my journey. So I, I came to, I first started off at Madigan Army Medical Center located in, in Seattle, Washington. And then I started off there in a med surge ward for my first year. And then I, that was during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm in 1990. And then after about a year, I was able to specialize after getting experience under my belt and I decided to become a pediatric nurse. And I worked for about five or six years as a pediatric nurse in different settings, mother, baby, NICU, feeder and grower. Um, I then worked in, after three years there, I went to Korea for one year and spent a year in Korea. And I worked in a mother, baby nursery there. After that one year tour, I transferred to Germany and worked in Germany for two years, working on a pediatrics ward. And then I was offered an opportunity for a leadership position in Italy. So I moved to Pisa, Italy for two years and worked from Italy. And at that point in my career, after being in the military for eight years and knowing that our army was downsizing during that time, my pediatric specialty was discontinued within the military. So I had to select something else. So I decided to become a family nurse practitioner because it also included a pediatric 
population within that cohort. Now, which you should realize that to move up in rank within the military, you have two levels of career. You have your professional career and you have your um, military career. So you have to progress in both um, careers. So for, the, for your professional to be promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, you have to have a master's degree um, or Colonel. So you hear ranks like captain, lieutenant. So you start off as a lieutenant, then you go to a captain, then it's a major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, then you become a general officer, one, two, and three, and four star. Um, so at that point in my career, I had to make a decision to get promoted to the rank of major. I made a decision to come to the University of Michigan, obtain my master's degree. Um, and that was, um, I graduated in 2000. So during that time of discovery, as I was growing up as a nurse or, or in my profession, I also figured out kind of when I was about 32, hey, you know what? I'm gay. <laughs> and so then I came out actually here at University of Michigan and um, found a very receptive community here in terms of being able to, to engage in some counseling and, and thinking and meeting different communities within the LGBTQ plus community. This is also where I met my husband um, and we met each other and, we, and uh, 22 years later, we are married. We've been married since the Defense of Marriage Act was repealed. And um, so we're currently living in Pinckney, Michigan and I work for the Ann Arbor VA system. But let's talk more a little bit more about the journey. Professional journey was after University of Michigan, I practiced as a nurse practitioner. I deployed to Bosnia and Iraq with that experience, Bosnia peacekeeping. Um, I was actually my air, my, the plane I was in was over Ireland when the World Trade Centers fell and we landed in Bosnia. And then we had to go into emergency, um, an emergency stance spent six months there, came back home for 10 months and deployed to Iraq for six months in a desert location, 25 miles southwest of Baghdad. Um, and Matt, my husband was there throughout that. When um, after, so that's kind of the, the progress there um, in terms of timeline. And what I'm trying to build for you is how I progress in the military as well as my education um, so I had a master's degree to get to a rank of colonel in the army. You have to, it's called go to the army war college. So there are different, there's a basic course for your military career advanced course. There are a couple of correspondence courses you have to do the ultimate course to become a general officer or a colonel in the army. It's preferred that you attend the army war college. There's a naval one, air force war college as well. The end result of that is I obtained a master's in strategic studies. Followed quickly on the heel of that, with the advent of the doctor of nursing practice throughout the United States, we realized that there were cohorts of our, our younger officers at the lieutenant and captain rank who were interested in attending doctorate nursing practice programs, but we didn't have anybody at the senior level who would obtain that degree. So when I saw the opportunity, I jumped on it and the Army funded me to attend a two-year Duke a course at Duke University where I received my doctorate in nursing practice. Subsequent to that um, and having additional leadership positions, after obtaining, um, after coming back from, um, after getting that degree, I was able to then become the consultant to our Army Surgeon General for nurse practitioners. So for, for each of the services, not uh, for each of the services like Army, Air Force, Navy, they all have consultants to the, and each of the, each of the services has a surgeon general. And some people get that confused with our, our public health service general. And you hear that person on the radio frequently talking about COVID, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, in terms of, um, the intersection of being LGBTQ and the man in nursing, um, there are a so there there is an LGBTQ community plus community within the military, 
that's very strong. Many of the military posts do, do um, provide or have um, pride celebrations now that it's allowable. Um, the community has generally be accepted. I'm not sure many of you aware that they just, uh, the Navy just launched, I believe it's an aircraft carrier, a major ship of, um, dedicated to Harvey Milk. And he was an advocate for LGBT rights in San Francisco. Um, so lots of progress from the, within the military in accepting that community of practice. Um, I'm sorry, that community, the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so where the intersection is, where I'm thinking about is, um, I had a career as a professional, I had a career as an officer and being gay was just a part of who I am, part of my identity, part of who I am. And so it was just a facet of me. And for the years that uh, Matt and I were together, before the Defense of Marriage Act, there was Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And we just would not, uh, we would hide. We, would, we weren't out in public. So no hand, holding hands in public. If we were together at the mall and I saw somebody who was in my unit, I would signal to Matt, you know, stiffen up, you know, look, and then Matt would head one direction. I would head another, head another direction. And so that no association could be made we would close our window shades so that if we wanted to give our, each other a hug or a kiss, we could do that in private. Um, but after Defense of Marriage Act and every, the laws changed and everything opened up, then our relationship became more open. And um, most of the people at work kind of knew anyway. They didn't have an issue with it. Uh, they were openly accepting. In fact, right after Matt and I got married, we went to the ID section in the military and we were both able they didn't even blink an eye. Here's the marriage license. Okay, let's get your photograph. It was very seamless in terms of um, him being accepted. And he's an ID code holder today. So that that was really kind of a really uh, actually pretty awesome experience for us. Um, so um, uh, somebody has put in the chat and the question I'd like to answer is, um, advanced practice roles in the military service. So we have clinical nurse specialists. We, um, there are family nurse practitioners. There's women's health practitioners. We re, the Army just funded three people to do become emergency room uh, ER, emergency department uh, nurse practitioners as well. And so there's a wide variety of uh, opportunities at the advanced practice level within the military. Um, we um, just as a, a little bit of a fact, two uh, there have been about 40 generals. I'm sorry, I think 43. 43 generals are the Army Nurse Corps or the course of its history. Two of those have been male. One is Brigadier Bill Bester, who retired, and our current chief of the Army Nurse Corps is General Jack. Um, Oh my gosh, friend Jack, we went to war college together. I remember his name. Anyway, he's Brigadier General um, Jack Davis, and he is a family nurse practitioner. So that's our current leader within the Army Nurse Corps. And I keep still keep in touch, even though I'm a retiree now, uh, in touch with folks to try to make sure that our um, advanced practice equities are represented within the nurse corps. And they are, again, looking at the role of the emergency room nurse practitioner, especially during in conflict areas. So hopefully that answers the question about advanced roles in military service. I know I'm pinging around kind of a lot, but I know there's a lot of interest in this area and I appreciate having the opportunity to speak today to all of you. Um, so I've talked to you a little bit about being gay in the military. I've talked to you a little bit about my progression in the career. I know people are interested, how do I, how did I get a leadership position within the VA? Well, the last six years that I worked for the Army, I worked in quality and safety. And, you know, I didn't know that I would start at quality and safety. As I started my career, it sort of progressed over time. And why that's important is because I started off knowing very early on, I was really frustrated. I, I knew I could, I knew if I did this, I could fix this. 
but there was no way for me as a frontline person, a staff worker, to be able to affect the change other than saying, I can help the person sitting in front of me, I can help the family sitting in front of me and do the best I can as a healthcare provider, especially when, when I became a nurse practitioner. And so as I learned about more about systems and processes, I realized that as I became a leader within the military and a leader within my profession, that I had opportunities to influence policy because policy can actually help change things, not only for the patient who's the recipient of our, our healthcare, but also the entire team that uh, provides that care for, for, our, our, for our patients. And in this case, our veterans. So the last six years I spent with, um, in it, with quality and safety within the Army Medical Command working on policy and procedures um, and quality and safety, looking at systems data across systems. And when I retired, um, um, I looked at how, I thought about how can I continue to serve my fellow veterans? And you know, tomorrow's Veterans Day. And it's important that, it, and I wanted to give back to my fellow veterans and continue serving because um, one of the facts that's a fun fact to kind of think about is only about 1% of people in the United States ever serve in the military. And so that's why we honor, we're honoring those folks tomorrow. And that's why I honor them as a fellow veteran to continue to serve because I understand the sacrifices they make, they have made, and they understand the sacrifices I made to be uh, in the closet and then out of the closet. And we have open discussions about those things today. So it's very refreshing. So um, I guess I would say is that um, the, those experiences at the last six years of the Army Medical Command led me this job open in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I, got, I met my husband, I got my master's degree, University of Michigan rocks. I love the School of Nursing. So when I came back here, I, I looked at a job that came online for to work in for the Veterans Health Administration. And the office happened to be located here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And my family lives, well, I have one sister who lives in Waterford near Detroit. And the rest of my family is in the Upper Peninsula. That's a lot closer than Texas, where I ended up then flying from Texas to Michigan to figure out, you know, help with family stuff. So I said, what a wonderful opportunity. And it's in Ann Arbor, one of my favorite places to be. Um, and where Matt and I met 22 years ago. So that seemed, it was just really serendipity that we moved back here. And I was accepted as the, as a, as the executive um Deputy Executive Director for the National Center for Patient Safety. And that was an organization that was established for the Veterans Health Administration. Um, and it, it's an administrative office that I work out at Domino's Farm. So I'm not at the university, I'm down at the, that big long building, Domino's Farms and Lobby M. And um, we run out of here. So we're not in DC, we're in, we're actually not located. We're part of the big corporate office for the veterans, um, the, the command structure of the Veterans Health Administration were actually located out here in Michigan because we, the founders of the organization in 2011 realized to get away from the headquarters perspective and get more of an academic flavor and emerging patient safety science, they needed to be in the field. And so um, that's why the office was here. And this particular office was founded in 1999 because of an Institute of Medicine report or another prestigious organization came out and said, you know, we probably need to do more in patient safety and quality than we're doing. We probably need to start talking about zero harm. And um, how do we meet that goal of zero harm and protecting our patients? What should our wrong site surgery retain for an object's rates be? What should our rates of central line acquired immune, you know, cl cotty, clapsy, central line acquired urinary tract infection, et cetera, what should that look like? How can we do quality improvement across the system so that we can eliminate these zero harm events? So that's the sort of um, 
level I'm working at now is the policy level. How can we educate people about patient safety, make everyone a patient safety advocate? It doesn't matter your role within the healthcare setting. You could be a window washer, a nurse, a physician, nurse practitioner, PA, whatever your role is. We're all patient safety advocates and we have a role to report, right? To say, stop the line, embracing a high reliability organization, pillars, deference to expertise, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm looking over at my bulletin board because there's a bunch of good stuff over there we're working on. But um, so we, our core f uh, mission for the National Center for Patient Safety is working on policy across the organization. What does that look like? We have joint partnerships with the Department of Defense, Defense Health Agency mandated by Congress. Um, we're helping to roll out the new electronic health record and understand the patient safety equities within the electronic health record. So we set policy procedure guidance on how to do root cause analysis, other proactive risk assessments, so we can get more to the predictive end of what we do. So a lot of patient safety and quality data, as you may be aware, is retroactive. We wait three months for HEDIS measures. Those are the health indicators, indexes like your breast cancer screening and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but instead of being retroactive, waiting for data to come as a result of our system, how can we be more proactive in assessing our system? So there is one particular document we have. It's a checklist called the MEHOC, Mental Health Environment of Care Checklist, where we ask facilities to go out and look at their inpatient psychiatric units and go down this checklist to see if they've eliminated things like ligature risks in different areas, over doors, over door knobs. Do they have the right kind of windows? Do they have the right kind of glass? What kind of facility modifications can we do? And so that's one, one of many efforts we're involved in. Um, our particular office is also um, involved in recall. So if the FDA has a recall, my office deals with that recall and puts out guidance throughout the 174 facilities in the Veterans Health Administration. So um, those are just high level things right now. I, I can tell you much more. We have a fellowship program for multidiscipl multidisciplinary people who are interested in patient safety. You come on from a year and do an advanced fellowship in patient safety with us. We have four slots here at the National Center for Patient Safety. We have a, a, a chief residence in quality and safety for, for physicians to learn more about quality and safety and be HRO leaders as well. So a lot of great opportunities that we build within the organization. Um, and so um, that's kind of generally what we do here at the National Center for Patient Safety. Um, and it's been great to be able to be not only a leader, but a nurse leader. And the VHA has had for many years a culture to uh, diversity inclusion office to include an LGBTQ office and with the current uh, administration um, with Secretary McDonough, they've embraced culture di diversity and inclusion and uh, are really celebrating that and highlighting that within our organization in a multi multiple ways. In fact, the secretary has pulled that office up to his level to make sure we have uh, the diversity inclusion uh, for everybody throughout the VA and looking at different programs they'd like to implement. So um, I'd like to stop and just see what other questions what we have um, in the chat as well. So if people could place questions either in the chat or use the reaction to raise their hand, that'd be great. We could call on anyone. Yeah. Um, I just had a quick question. Sure. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand a little more on how you went from this role of getting your DNP and then transitioning from uh, like a uh, quote unquote, like family nurse practitioner in the um, area where you were over to like quality and safety. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so thanks for that. So think about when I got my doctor nursing practice, it added a certain tools to my toolbox. So, at, and I'll just speak to me. So, at Duke, not only we're looking at, we look at, instead of looking at a particular issue within a hospital, we were looking at data from a national perspective. 
How do I look at the NH the data from NHRQ? How do I pull up those population statistics to look at population health across the board? What can I think about doing in that space from a policy perspective? Um, so that was very interesting. What do I, uh, learning much more, learning how to implement and teach evidence-based practice concepts to further profession instead of the pure research, how do we get clinical, our clinical research into practice faster than the 17 years that takes to translate evidence from research into practice, right? Being that communication mode and making sure that's happening at, with nursing, with the DNP, and then the policy piece, learning about policy. What, are the, what does all this legislator stuff mean and how do we interact with Congress and why it's important to be in organizations like the one you're representing today? The AP, being advanced practice nurse, representing and talking at um, ANCC or the different organizations. I've talked to the Indiana Nurse Practitioners Association. I've been a guest speaker at the Pennsylvania Nurse Practitioners Annual Meeting. I present regularly at um, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners AANP convention. I speak there. I'm a fellow there really investing into the community, all getting that doctor nursing practice really rounded out my perspective of the profession and gave me some of those additional tools. An example is we had to have a, uh, we had to do like elevator speeches. We also had to be, also be able ready to present to a congressman and congresswoman. So we actually had a panel from the uh, North Carolina House of Representatives and we had to sit there not we did it in the classroom. It was not in, in the Capitol building, but it was in the classroom where we had to present to this panel who were sitting in front of us and pitch our idea and answer their questions rapid fire. So that was also very beneficial. The reason I tell you that's beneficial is I may have to testify in front of a Congress on December 2nd about patient safety stuff that they want to know about. So I'm, I'm looking forward to tapping that experience because I would not have gotten that. So think about purely clinical focus, learning about pharma, pathopharmacology, what we need to do to keep, uh, for, keep, you know, just look and help the person and people in front of us versus working at a policy level um, and that those other pieces uh, to ensure that our healthcare system is safe. Um, and that's why I started looking at this, because if you start looking at data, you start noticing health inequity in our data you start noticing populations who are underserved and why is that and why aren't we addressing that? Um, and so this is a way for me to influence those things too, to include being a representative of the LGBTQ community at senior leadership levels within the VA. I have a whole bunch of stuff I bring to the, to the table. I have all my military experience and plus I'm this neat guy who's got a cool past and I happen to be gay. It's just a piece of, and part of who I am, right? So that's how I like to portray that. How can we strengthen the parts? So thanks, I hopefully the answer is that, how it changed my clinical practice. I did, just so you know, that before coming to Michigan, I did still try to practice a couple of times a month in a clinic doing kind of acute care with our active duty soldiers. But right now um, my job doesn't allow me to do as much clinical but I do volunteer for the University of Michigan as an unpaid faculty member. And I'm doing intermittent lectures and guest speaking like this. And um, I also mentored a master's degree nurse practitioner student last term for her rotation and look forward to future opportunities to include joining the men's group that was described today. Um, and then how can we strengthen the partnership between the nurses and the armed forces and the school of nursing? What's well, interesting, um, you know, whether you know it or not, there's probably a cohort of military nurses that are enrolled in each, a lot of the universities have some positions open to enroll military nurses. And they're coming in at the captain major level. Um, and so getting to know those people and their experiences and how you can collaborate. I have lifelong friendships with people who I met in my master's program that I still correspond with to say, hey, is this happening out there in your world? This is happening in my world. And what are you guys thinking and learning and 
seeing and experiencing. Um, and then, um, so I think um, there's the ROTC programs that are present at many universities. Get to know the, the folks because they're what they're trying to do is they're trying to serve, um, bring all the skills they're learning with you and bring them to other populations. So what I would say is I loved coming to the University of Michigan because we had people in the program from Ch China, no, sorry, Korea. I think there was a, an individual from the Philippines um, and different cultures. And I'd have to say one of the favorite things I've done in all my travels is to learn different cultures. I've been to China, uh, I've been to, I've been all over the world uh, just to share with you really quickly. It's one of the reasons I joined the military um, other than paying off student debt. Uh, it was, um, you know, when I was in um, Korea, I got to visit Thailand twice. I've been through Hong Kong multiple times. Um, I did a tour around Hong Kong, actually. I've been able to visit Japan and be there for three months and explore Japan, Tokyo, Camp Zama area, be there for the fall festival. Also an interesting fertility, right? <laughs> festival that someone brought me to and I was like, wow. Uh, uh, also while in Germany, I traveled to Egypt and explored Egypt. While living in Italy, I traveled to Greece and was able to see Athens. I've been to Paris four times when I was stationed in Germany. Really getting to know and experience culture and meet people where they're at was a wonderful opportunity that I had prior to going to grad school, right, at University of Michigan. I was able to bring all those experiences forward to that because there's such a great diversity of people at the University of Michigan, very opening accept and accepting that it was just a wonderful place to be, to center myself at that point in my life where I was sort of discovering this other kind of part of myself, being gay, that part. Um, so, um, Hopefully that helps uh, that. Um, then how can you build all the relationships? It's just reaching out and talking to, to them, embracing them, understanding their experiencing experiences um, and be aware that when you, even as uh, if you're in the student role, you can still go to AANP and attend some of these conferences. There's a military nursing track within AANP that people can go to. You can sign up for, there's an army, air force, navy track. There's a combined track. And they talk about common issues that are occurring within the military healthcare system. What's even more interesting is the now that there's the Defense Health Agency, which is the new umbrella agency over the medical services. Um, there's a, been a lot more collaboration with the nurse corps between the Army, Navy, and Air Force Nurse Corps. All right. And I see another question by. I hate, I don't want Patel, I won't try to pronounce the last name because I hate, I'm very sensitive to mispronouncing words. No, oh, that's correct. My name is Prashika Patel. It's such an honor to have you here today. Thank you for, for joining us. I, I, I just had a question, really, the, um, the chapter of the American Association of Men in Nursing, they've had discussions in the past about building the, the pipeline and um, reaching out to youth and families to generate interest and confidence in pursuing this path. And I'm just wondering, you have so many experiences. And so I'm just wondering if you've ever been able to see a program or an approach or, or um, you know, just a, a strategy that you found really compelling and, and effective in this space of working with, with youth and families. I haven't been able to, because so, I haven't been able to work in that space as much, but I do, I do want to expand that ability because I think it's important to provide that love. So what my effort here today is one of those efforts to reach out and share my experiences so that we can get more folks into the, into the nursing um, and to be able to open those opportunities because I moved back after 30 years. I don't, we we're just, and because of COVID, unfortunately, we are just reestablishing friendship networks, making new friends as we're able to. Um, and so that those friends who used to be here have all moved on to different things in their lives, different states. But I do think it's important to get in, into the high schools, into other settings, 
you know, that's really, if you read anything, that's really where my, my uh, other than being a kid and wanting to do nursing for a long time, because I had some medical problems, I was, a, I went to nurse's aid class in high school and got my nurse's aid certificate and, and volunteered at nursing homes to work. So that's, that's when my interest started in, in healthcare. I think we need to capture other folks too and explain to them that this is a healthcare pro, uh, uh, profession for everyone. Um, and that at the end of the day, we have our patient and families to serve and that, um, you know, and I would just say that with the shortages coming up in many different areas, it's going to become an open market. And I think that if I have to say this, uh, and I don't like fee fee for service models, and I don't like paying for healthcare. It's my personal opinion, but um, the, the the pay will probably go up as the demand increases. So if people are looking for a successful career. You know, that's always the bottom line for some people is the salary versus the altruistic, you know, I want to serve others, I want to do better by others. Um, so I think it's going to be a mix of messaging and recruiting on multiple uh, lanes of effort from uh, the, like the association that's meeting today, AANP, we really need a wide variety of uh, uh, workforce to be in place. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. The other thing, the other thing I'll just say is I've been um, really concerned. When you look at the information out there, and I, I've talked at a couple of conferences about this, is that by 2040 or 2050, there's not going to be enough primary care physicians graduating from um, their programs because the schools of medicine are not producing as many family practice physicians. It's not in demand. It's not desirable. They're not getting paid a lot. So the Institute of Medicine, the other organizations have already war uh, sounded the warning bell about this. And they, that's why they come out with statements like everyone needs to work to the top of their scope and licensure. They've also said things like, um, and that's why we have the DMP, right? And it's gonna take a mixed healthcare team of people to provide care in the future. That's why we have doc physical therapists now have their doctorates. We have the DNP role. We have the PharmD role because it's going to take all of us to provide health care because there's just not going to be that cohort that's also associated with the baby boomers aging out and retiring a, a mass amount. And that's where nursing is going to have a shortage as well, is that baby boomers aging out and then a population different, you know, millennials, X generation, I'm X, millennials, you know, the next generation, everybody kind of knowing what that is, that role is. Um, and I would say that an interesting perspective here is as nursing becomes more technological with our, IM, our interfaces with technology, and as, as we integrate with other disciplines like biomedical engineering and other um, people who can come to the table and help us understand the healthcare environment, that's where the draw is. That's where genomics, all this late stuff and the latest, uh, you know, information on genomics, that cutting edge stuff, I believe is going, it's going to be attractive to people of multiple generations. So uh, Gila, uh, Christina, uh, any advice for new DNP starting their career within the DHA? Um, I would say um, be aware that um, the VA, so one thing in the military, you have federal supremacy clause, which when you're deployed allows you to do what you need to do to save the soldier. It, uh, you're not restricted by state practice acts. So if I need to put in an A line, I put in an A line. If I need to, so I've never done that by the way, I'm just saying that's when you're deployed, you're trying to save a human, you're in a mass casualty situation, you're trying to save lives, everyone trains for that, ACLS, et cetera, et cetera. When you come back to the States, you, we have federal supremacy uh, in the military. And that says you can, under your scope of licensure and practice, you can practice to the maximum extent. And then if the um, director of the hospital called the commander 
if that person authorizes you to do minor procedures, as long as you're credentialed and privileged and monitored using Joint Commission FPP, which is um, the reoccurring professional evaluation, and your all your, your peer reviews are adequate, then you can continue doing those functions. The VA is now embarking on looking at federal supremacy for all nurses within the VHA. That includes nurse anesthetists, advanced practice nurses, because they also realize there's going to be a healthcare provider shortage and they need to incre we need to increase that ability. Lots of pushback from the American Medical Association, lots of pushback from the folks that do anesthesia right now up to even into Congress. Listen to that the other day. One or two Congress people who are vehemently opposed to this within the VA. So having said that, the VA, VHA um, for the DMP, making sure that you have a sound partner in terms of someone, regardless of status, even with uh, the federal supremacy, I always had a very collegial relationship with my physician colleagues and the other healthcare professions. Um, remember, when you're in the military in particular, I'm a colonel, you're a colonel. There's a rank thing here too, right? We're equal. So there's no, uh, if there's a captain who's a, who happens to be a physician and I'm a colonel and I tell the captain to do something, they're gonna execute the mission. It doesn't matter because it's the rank structure. Now in the civilian sector, it's a little bit different. Um, and I'm just trying to translate a little bit here for folks. Within the new VA, I think if you're a new DNP, especially if you're new in clinical practice, I always advise people to start off um, really the first couple of years in your practice, cementing your capabilities, your skills, making sure you're soundly founded in clinical practice because um, that's what's most important it, because throughout your career, people are gonna reference back to what you accomplished as a clinical provider and they want to relate to you from that, that aperture. What did you do clinically? How did you do that? How long did you do that um, sometimes? And so I feel I get more street credibility by um, having those experiences. Sorry, lots of e emails popping up here. Um, so what I would say, consolidate your practice. And then when you're ready, when you think you've got the system figured out where you're working, not only your team system, but your direct, your direct, you know, like you're in the office, your primary care office, and then there's a, a, a department, figure out your department and the nuances that, and then the larger uh, facility, start getting involved, start getting involved at each of those levels to show that you're ready and interested in taking on responsibility, especially as a leader. Um, I have been able to define my career by looking at something and say, I wanna do that and I go and do it. I have an interest in this. I wanna take a leadership position. Even if it's not something you are interested in, people know, hey, this person stood up and they wanna take leadership in this. Um, and, and they look at, they're watching, everyone's watching and listening to you and they're understanding how you're partnering and collaborating with other people. So really I, that is what gets you in, when you're in those kind of meetings, then you hear something else. Someone says, oh, but as part of this, there's this other thing. And then you have a, you do more system discovery. There's more and more you learn as you expose yourself to different opportunities. That might be a clinical leadership position. Um, I was, uh, for example, I was helping roll out the primary care medical home model within the um, army. So I was a clinical leader helping to do that and helping to interpret staffing requirements, et cetera, et cetera. But that led me to other things like, hey, what about this quality piece over here? How are we gonna measure that? So you never know what conversations in these positions can lead you to do. So it's been very interesting from, from that perspective as to um, how I got involved on these different uh, different opportunities that I've been able to avail myself of. What other questions can I answer? It, look, it looks like we have a hand up from Holly. Holly, do you want to answer your, or ask your question now? Yes. Hi, sir. I just want to begin by saying thank you for your service, and it's an honor and a privilege to hear you speak today. Um, I have to throw this out there. Um, I 
uh, am a veteran as well. And I actually, my first duty station was at Madigan Army Medical Center. So I have to ask, what floor were you on? I, I just need to know. <laughs> well, first of all, Holly, I was on Ward 21 of the old hospital. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's an before, administrative building now. <laughs> before I moved to the new hospital, I don't remember the floor. I think it was six something. It was the mother baby unit. That's where I worked. Oh, that's awesome. I was on the, the uh, seven north of the new hospital, the post-surgical ward. But um, yeah, no, small world. It's always a small world, world with the military. So, um, but I just have a quick question. Um, so I, I transitioned from active duty and I had like mentally prepped myself and um, my transition was actually more difficult than I anticipated. And so um, from your standpoint, after being fully immersed in the military and having an incredibly successful and colorful career. Um, as a professional, a nursing professional, how was your transition into the civilian life? Or, and are there any recommendations that you have from having such a success, you know, military successful career, and then not necessarily starting over, but transitioning into a very different culture and environment? Yeah, I, you bring up some great questions because when you're in the military, there's like this family of people that surround you that you can rely on. And it becomes like your second family from your nuclear family that you emerge from like a butterfly, right? I like to say that sometimes. Um, but what I would say is that um, I knew that I needed that structure, that family around me as I graduated from 30 years of being in the military. So that's why I was looking for an opportunity within the VA, because I knew that the people within the VA, many of them have served and they understood my story. And, and, um, and I have fellow veterans who are gay too, just as an aside. Um, and so it really helped me to you know, bring that piece in um, and to keep in that, that community. I would also say the other part that's really important is being involved and or like coming back and saying, all right, I need to be involved at the University of Michigan. I wanna give back to the university. I also need to be involved in my professional organizations like AANP. I wanna become involved in this organization that's meeting today too. I think that's very important. So I think building your community that you wanna surround yourself with is really important. Um, and then networking. Um, I still belong to the Army Nurse Corps Association. I run the evidence-based practice um, grant program, by the way. We award money every year. Um, so um, those are the ways I stay in touch with my retired colleagues through the Army Nurse Corps Association, but then remain relevant within the VA, making sure. So that's how I manage that. But what you're experiencing is what many people experience. You go from this really well-designed, well structured sort of environment, sort of like you have a cocoon around you in a way, and then all of a sudden you go and there's, not, there's no more support structure. You're on your own. And it's sort of this entirely different world. And it can be difficult in that transition. So, and if you ever want to reach out to me and talk, please do so. I'll give you my phone number. Uh, well, I'll provide that to you because we need to provide this level of support for each other, no matter where we're at in our journey, our career or journey. So definitely that's an opportunity I'd like to give to you. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. What other comments uh, can I give to folks? Looks like we're receiving a lot of thank yous in the chat, just so you know. And we have about five minutes left to go. So if anyone has any burning questions, let's go ahead. I can ask an overall question real quick. I don't know if uh, Dr. Joyner or anyone knows or if maybe you would have uh, knowledge. Is there a strong, um, I guess, uh, group for uh, veterans to go currently at the University of Michigan for uh, nursing to go speak with people or meet up for coffee? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I tried, you know, I did try Googling some different groups when I first arrived here. 
and I saw that there was a, you know, the speakers uh, for the LGBTQ plus, and I tried to sign up for that. I'm not sure how successful I was because no one ever called me back, but I, uh, you know, uh, but I, that would be interesting. I'm not sure that there is such a entity, but I'll defer to the other experts on the, uh, on this presentation. Um, I know that there's um, a veterans group that is um, in a very infancy stage. Um, and um, Jenna, you know, at the grad school um, administrative building, she's Jenna Long, she's um, kind of heading that whole initiative. And she's done a lot of great work last year with putting some, uh, you know, reaching out to veterans and kind of creating a, a community. But um, yeah, we, uh, I had spoken to her last or a couple of years ago and two years ago, and um, there is that need for community um, within the veterans. And so it's slowly getting there, but yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. And I, and I put the, um, my name, Holly, it's Holly. I'm sorry, Holly. Holly, I put my phone number in the yeah. chat for you. Uh -huh. um, and I would just say that that's important because we have 22 veterans a day that commit suicide in the United States. Um, even though we have multiple, multiple programs to reach out, this is very helpful, especially during times like Veterans Day when we start to reflect on our service. And some of us who have post-traumatic stress disorder, it's very, it weighs on our souls. Um, and so we can talk about PTSD some other time because, um, yeah because I'm one of those people who are in that category. Um, but um, This is Linda Strodman speaking on Emerita faculty. I would also like to, you to be aware of the potential of networking with the Emerita faculty. There are a number who are military veterans and they have done work in stress management and so on, like Dr. Reg Williams, Dr. Penny Pierce, um, there's quite a few. So I would say reach out to the Emerita group and uh, see if we can get a support group going because there's a lot of people that are uh, faculty retired that were in the military. Yeah, I know Dr. Pierce. I helped her in one of her studies when I was at University of Michigan. So if you get to talk to Penny, say, hey, from Ed. And it, can, can you spell that? Is it Emeritus Group? E N E R M E. Is that how you spell it? I'm not sure, she said. Yeah, the Emerita Group. E M E R I T U S. Emeritus, and they're also listed in the School of Nursing directory. Um, the Emerita faculty are there. So, um, if you need more, uh, I'm on the faculty, Emerita faculty. You can contact me and I can help you network. Awesome, thanks so much, appreciate that. And my name is Linda Strodman, S-T-R-O-D-T-M-A-N. Thanks, Linda, appreciate that. All right, we have about a minute left. Anyone have any last comments or questions? I just wanna say thank you and uh, thank you for your service and everything. Thanks. I hope this has been valuable for folks. I know I sort of rambled on in my conversation. Um, I, I, it's hard to capture 30 years of service in that, but um, just know that there's uh, senior leaders that are nursing within the VA healthcare system, and I am a senior executive service, um, which is um, high up in the, in the VA in terms of um, organizational structure. So Thanks for, thanks for all you do. Thanks for um, culture, diversity, equity, inclusion, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Really great, to, great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.